Okay, welcome back. This is Chapter 6 lecture on telescopes. This is one of my favorite lectures to give, so here we go. These are some radio telescopes. They're probably out in New Mexico somewhere. Uh, we can listen to radio waves from space like we saw in the last chapter in Chapter 5 about the electromagnetic spectrum. We have radio waves along with visible light and infrared and ultraviolet we can look at. So how do our eyes and cameras work? We're going to look at this. Here's our eye. We have a lens and a pupil. It goes back to the retina in the back and an optic nerve that goes to the brain. The process of refraction is the bending of light when it passes from one substance to another. Your eye uses refraction to focus light. Refraction at sunset the sun appears distorted at sunset because of how light bends in Earth's atmosphere. So our eyes and the lens focuses light into a point. We call that point the focus. And the point goes to the retina and to the optic nerve. Now, these days, of course, we, use, we don't use film anymore. We use recording devices. And in astronomy, we have a special type of a digital camera called a CCD. This is called a charge-coupled device. Basically, a fancy name for a very sensitive digital camera. So these cameras focus light, just like an eye does, and captures the image with the detector. The CCD detectors and digital cameras are similar to those used in modern telescopes. And if you have a uh, video camera at home, you, uh, maybe an older one, you might see CCD on it on the side. Most CCDs these days are actually very delicate, expensive objects, uh, uh, cameras, and can cost tens of thousands of dollars and are cooled with liquid nitrogen. While well, astronomers often use computer software to combine, sharpen, or refine these images, this is an image of Saturn's moon Enceladus. This has been produced to highlight the plume of water ice coming from its surface. Most pictures in astronomy are actually black and white and then we color enhance them. So how do our eyes and cameras work? We have learned that the eyes use refraction again to bend parallel light rays to form an image and if the image is in focus the focal plane is at the retina. Cameras focus light just like your eye does and record the image with a detector. So let's look at telescopes. What are two most important properties of a telescope? If you go to Walmart or you go to a, a store to uh, Best Buy maybe to buy a telescope, they're going to try to tell you uh, that they can magnify 3,000 times magnifying power. That doesn't matter. You don't want a telescope that magnifies all that much. We want a light gathering device. And so what's important to a telescope is light gathering area, light collecting area of a telescope. Of a larger collecting area can gather a greater amount of light in a shorter time. So a, an 8-inch an telescope is much better at gathering light than a 4-inch telescope. Currently, the biggest telescopes in the world are close to 10 or 11 meters in size. The other big thing is angular resolution. Telescopes that are larger are capable of taking images with greater detail. So a bigger telescope, a 10-meter telescope, can take very fine detail images, very high resolution. Okay, we're going to look at angular separa separation and angular resolution here. The minimum angular separation that a telescope can distinguish is its angular resolution. Let's skip this. Okay, the two basic designs of telescopes are refracting and reflecting. Refracting uses lenses and reflecting uses mirrors. Most modern telescopes are reflectors with mirrors. There's actually a physical size limit of 40 inches that can be made with a lens. So here it is, the world's largest refracting telescope. It's in near Chicago. Uh, refracting telescopes need to be very long with very large, heavy lenses. So we don't use these anymore. The reflecting telescope, like this one here, uh, use mirrors. And most of the mirrors these days are actually segments of mirrors that are combined together. Now, we'll just mention here that there are different designs of telescopes depending on where the focus is and where the light comes out. 
there's a Cassegrain focus, which is what I'm most familiar with using in my work of astronomy. A Newtonian focus, pretty uh, popular along with uh, amateurs. And a Cunade focus, which I've used before a little bit too. So here are the twin Keck telescopes in Hawaii, Mauna Kea uh, Observatory. 10 meters in diameter, these, t these mirrors, and there's really 36 mirrors to get to, 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 together combined to make a 10 meter telescope. A 10 meter mirror all by itself would be very heavy. You have to make a piece of glass to support that mirror uh, and then coat it with aluminum. That wouldn't be very practical, so we make smaller mirrors and then combine them together. What do we do with telescopes? We do imaging, take pictures of the sky, but that's really not most of what is done in astronomy. Most of astronomy, 80% of it, is actually spectroscopy, breaking the light into spectra, which you mentioned in chapter 5. And time monitoring, measuring how light output varies with time, which is what I've done in my work. I did eclipsing binary stars, which are two stars, they orbit each other, and they eclipse each other like a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse would. And I monitor those stars for a long time. So astronomical detectors generally record only one color of light at a time. We can put color filters in front of them, to uh, in front of the detector to get several images. These images must be combined to make a full color picture. So you have to take a red, green, and a blue and combine it to get a full color image. Astronomical detectors can record forms of light our eyes can't see, and the color is sometimes used to represent different energies of the non-visible light. In this image, we have red as low energy x rays and blue as high energy x rays. So, in spectroscopy, we have a device called a spectrograph, which separates the different wavelengths of light before they hit the detector. We use graphing to show relative brightness of light at each wavelength in a spectrum. And time monitoring, this is kind of what I did. Uh, light curve represents a series of brightnesses measurements that are made over a period of time. This would probably be an eclipsing binary star right here, or a Mira variable it looks like, uh, and it gets brighter and dimmer over a period of so many days. Well, what if you want to buy your own telescope? It's a question I get a lot in this class. Well, buy, buy binoculars first, maybe a 7 by 35 pair. You'll get much more for the same money. Ignore the magnification, it's a sales pitch, like I said. Notice the aperture size is a 8 inch, is a 4 inch telescope. Optical quality, the portability, how easy is it to move around. And do your consumer research. Look at magazines like Astronomy, Sky and Telescope, Mercury Magazine, and local astronomy clubs. We actually have a Springfield Astronomical Society and the Ozarks Amateur Astronomers Club in Springfield. So we have learned that collecting area is much better than magnification. And the angular resolution is dependent on the size of the telescope. Refracting are with lenses and reflecting telescopes use mirrors. And most professional telescopes are reflectors. With telescopes, we do imaging, spectroscopy, and time monitoring. Now let's take a look at telescopes and the atmosphere. Our goals for this is how the Earth's atmosphere affects ground-based observations and why do we put telescopes in space. Well, the best ground-based sites for astronomy are calm, not too windy, high, less atmosphere to see through, dark, far from the city lights, and dry, very few cloudy nights. So most of the time these are on top of uh, mountains. There's light pollution to deal with. This is a scattering of human-made light in the atmosphere, and it's a growing problem in astronomy. You can see here maybe why we put more telescopes out west and on islands for that reason. Twinkling and turbulence. We actually call twinkling scintillation. And so this is when we have uh, the twinkling of the starlight. It's caused by turbulent airflow in Earth's atmosphere, which distorts our view, causing the stars to appear to twinkle. We can solve that problem with adaptive optics and the Keck telescopes to have this. This is a rapidly changing the shape of a telescope's mirror, which compensates for some of the effects of the turbulence and the twinkling. So on the bottom of those mirrors at Keck, those 36 mirrors, there are pistons, actuators, that rapidly adjust the shape of the mirror uh, with the help of a laser beam to affect for the uh, scintillation, the twinkling in the sky, the, the twinkling. 
So here is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This is a calm, high, dark, dry site. The best observing sites are atop remote mountains. But why do we put telescopes in space then? Like the Hubble Space Telescope we see here from Edwin Hubble in Marshfield. Well, only radio and visible light passes easily through our atmosphere, so we need telescopes in space to observe other forms. So we have a number of different telescopes in space to look at different wavelengths of light, and we're going to be launching a, a replacement for Hubble. You know, Hubble was put up about 25 years ago, uh, 1990, by the space shuttle. And so we're have a, uh, we'll have a replacement soon called the James Webb Space Telescope. Now let's look at the technology of telescopes. How can we observe invisible light and how can multiple telescopes work together? Well, here's a standard satellite dish. I have one of these at my house for direct TV. A standard satellite dish is essentially a telescope for observing radio waves. Here is the uh, Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. The largest tel uh, radio telescope in the world. It's actually not even a, a standalone telescope it's built into the mountainside there and so you may have seen this on the movie contact a radio telescope is like a giant mirror that reflects radio waves to a focus we also have a, a 747 called sophia that is a, a airplane with a telescope hanging outside of it we have the spitzer telescope in space these are infrared and ultraviolet light telescopes that operate like visible light telescopes do, but need to be above the atmosphere to see all wavelengths. The fly of the Sophia spacecraft, the aircraft with the telescope in it, because it gets above all the uh, water vapor in the atmosphere to observe infrared light. We have the Chandra X-ray Observatory. A good friend of mine works on this telescope, and it's in space to observe X-rays that we can't see on the Earth. We also have gamma ray observatories. They need to be in space because gamma rays can't come through the Earth. And uh, the focusing on the gamma rays is extremely difficult because they have such high energies to them, as we discussed in Chapter 5 also. Well, we've seen this picture before of these multiple radio telescopes. Is there a way that we can link them together and use them in a better way? Yes, there is. And that way is called interferometry. This is a technique for linking two or more telescopes so that they have the angular resolution of a single large telescope. So by hooking up multiple telescopes, we effectively make a large telescope larger out of that way. This is easiest to do with the radio telescopes. We have a very large array of radio telescopes in New Mexico. And now it's possible with infrared and visible light telescopes to do this process.